Okay, so please allow me to introduce our moderator. Andrew Kutz has been living and working in Portugal for three decades and running the ILM development planning business since 1999. He has a particular affinity for the Algarve and over the years has led a number of development projects on behalf of investors, which include, amongst others, the Hilton Villa Mora and Conrad Algarve. He has also been the board director for Val do Oliveira Resort in Carboeiro since 2012. ILM is currently developing and master planning resorts and residential community projects in Portimão, Lagos and Tavira. In addition to developing the innovative sustainable wellness community project Plantation Guadiana on this Algarve River. ILM normally organizes, and Andrew chairs, the annual Algarve Tourism Conference, though sadly um, not in 2020. Uh, uh, Andrew, please, I will pass the floor now to you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Sound is yes. good? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Cool. Great. Um, goodness me. Well, we were, we were to have 450-odd people um, on this webinar, which is quite daunting, um, albeit, of course, that I can't see anybody. Uh, so it's less daunting, but I can see um, the rogues gallery of speakers. And we've got two or three, I think, obviously, delegates or attendees from the audience um, that, have, that are also on, on, on this, main, this main screen. Um, so thank you, Adriana, for, for, for the kind introduction, which, of course, I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, I, am a, I am a virgin um, moderator of, uh, of Zoom, as, as, as you may imagine. Um, so we have to resort to all sorts of tricks to, to make sure that things run as smoothly as possible. Thankfully, we've got less technology going forward, and I think we'll be masters now of the, the session going forward. Um, really, we've allocated an hour um, for, for the webinar, um, and we have prepared, and I must admit, um, three questions for each of the speakers. And then, as Adriana has indicated, um, we will select um, six, Adriana and Helena will select six questions um, that'll come from um, the attendees or the Zoomies or whatever you will like from the audience. And then um, we will seek to, or the, there's three speakers, these three fine men will, will seek, to, um, seek to respond to those questions from, from, from the audience. Um, I'm sorry that you will not have fully appreciated the, um, the video, um, the uh, Can't Skip Hope video. Um, so I, I do urge you to, to jump onto YouTube and, and watch it. Um, I really think that it encapsulates perfectly uh, Portugal uh, and certainly encapsulates the moment that we were in at the beginning of March prior to being um, locked down um, and the key message there was it's time to stop and in the main we have all stopped the world has stopped um, and Portugal stopped um, and we in the UK are still stopped we're hoping to start again um, in the first week of May, the Portuguese government, I think, decided that it was time to start and announced a um, very well-structured, very coherent um, unlocking plan for all of May. Um, I think that is a measure of the way that the Portuguese government and also the Portuguese people have managed and, and have therefore overcome all of the hideous challenges of this C-19 thing. Um, the Portuguese are very, very resilient. The Portuguese are very, very resourceful. And having overcome um, the financial crisis and then partially overcome the Brexit crisis, we've now had the C-19 crisis. Um, I think that just only serves, in fact, to make us stronger um, and brings people together um, and we have wonderful gatherings like this and I think it's a very very healthy thing I think as a result of it we will be um, stronger and fitter um, going forward. Um, that leads nicely as it should do 
not that I'm a script writer, into me introducing these three fine fit men, our speakers. So I'm just going to briefly um, introduce the speakers and, and their companies to you. Okay. Um, Gavin Scott, Gavin will wave. You can see him. There he is. So Gavin is the CEO of Blevins Franks, um, which are the leading tax and wealth management advisors to expatriates in Portugal. Um, they're regulated by, importantly, by the FC in the UK, as well as all of the other relevant um, licensing authorities in Portugal. Um, despite Gavin's tender years, he's actually got 25 years in advising expatriates and was the founding partner of a of a IFA in the Sultanate of Brunei, which he must tell me about to have a glass of wine in the future. Um, so he has a lot of experience advising expatriates and high net worth families on all aspects of financial and succession planning with trusts and tax efficient structures and goodness knows what. Um, very serious company, very serious professional um, and really front of mind for the majority of expatriates in Portugal. And Gavin's been fortunate in spending now 20 years. He arrived in Portugal in, 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 in the Algarve in, in, in 2000, so 20, 20 years later. Um, Gavin's been somewhat challenged by the lockdown because he hasn't been able to support his favorite football team, which, which is called Partick Thistle, okay? Um, not Patrick Thistle, as my computer tried to lead me, but, Part, but Partick Thistle, one of the teams from, from Glasgow. Um, so he's had no football team to support. He hasn't been allowed on the golf course, nor on his boat. And therefore, he's had to resort to lots of fine wine drinking, um, fine wines of the Douro. He informs me. We'll now move on, if we may, to, to, to Miguel, Miguel Carneiro. Hello. One of two bearded gentlemen. Uh, Miguel is sales director of, of, uh, of Villamora World. Uh, Villamora World, for those of you who don't know, um, is the master developer of, of Villamora. Um, and Villamora World and the team there, which is quite considerable, is dedicated to designing, building and marketing beautiful homes and properties intended either as primary residence, secondary homes or by select investments. Today, and this surprised me, I must admit, well, I've known Portugal uh, Villamora for many, many years, it is actually home to more than 10,000 permanent residents. And that will create a very specific community feeling for Villamora. There's an international school, clinics, banks, and all sorts of fantastic communities, um, as well as, and importantly, a significant 170 hectare environmental park. Um, Miguel has over 15 years experience in the real estate sector. He has an MBA, and he has a very diversified business background, including time spent in the public sector, which is always useful. Um, Miguel is Portuguese, uh, originally from Lisbon. Um, he's a religious Benfica fan. Um, and besides Portugal, he's lived in the US, Spain, and Brazil. He is father to a beautiful girl, and I'm informed a stubborn boy. Where does he get that from? Um, both born in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. Um, and uh, I had to read this two or three times. He challenged a traditional Portuguese saying by marrying a Spanish woman. Now we must move on very quickly. Um, Miguel moved to Villamora about three years ago, and he believes that he has, as he should, he has found the place to live. And I'll just now move on to, excuse my paper rustling, to Tiago, Tiago Charge. Hi, good afternoon. Senior team member of the Final Country team uh, in the Algarve. Final Country, for those of you that don't know it, is a network of estate agents with over 300 offices across the globe. And the Final Country office um, in the Algarve uh, headquarters of the FNC in the Algarve is in the beautiful seaside resort of Carvedo, uh, which is sort of Midwest, and they have further offices in Almancil, uh, which serve the Golden Triangle, and Tavira, over in the beautiful eastern Algarve. So as you'd expect, uh, Final Country offers a comprehensive coverage for all of the Algarve, and they work with Final Country offices all over the world, and in particular, the offices in Lisbon, Greater Lisbon, at Palestra and Cascais, as well as Porto. The Final Country have a very lovely posh office in the top of Park Lane, in the centre um, of of, this, um, of uh, London. Thiago um, was born and raised in Oporto, uh, where he graduated in hotel management, 
as I did, good man. And he, he spent seven years in the hospitality industry and then took his career into, into property, where he worked with a delightful man, uh, God bless him, who passed away last year, Pedro, Pedro Van Riet, who was a top realtor, delightful Dutch chap. Um, and he worked uh, with, with Pedro, which is a great start to a career. Um, so he spent, spent a long time working in the sector and recently has moved to uh, work with Fine and Country um, in, in, the, in the Golden Triangle. Um, and I'm informed that he's not at work. Um, he loves the game of paddle. He looks quite fit. And to go out water skiing, my God, or to spend some time with his family. That should probably be in a different order, Tiago, but no, but no matter, no matter. So that um, concludes my introduction um, of, of uh, the speakers. And I will now move into a question session. Um, so we have, we have three speakers, each are going to respond to three um, prepared questions. Uh, it's important that in, in webinars of this nature that we are prepared such that you, you, you the audience, can drive as much benefit from the presence of, of um, these professionals. So Miguel is going to, uh, to kick off. Um, Miguel, what, differ differ what differentiates the Algarve from other regions of Portugal? And why should someone choose this region to invest and live? Well, thank you for organizing this uh, webinar. Well, uh, the Algarve, as you know, and uh, there is, of course, the, for real estate investment, you have location, location, location. And the Algarve reunites many things that we want to have when we think about investing. We have the weather, we have the infrastructures, we have all of the um, health uh, facilities as well. Um, so we have the airport. And this means that to start off, we already comply with the location um, prerogative. Another thing that it's very important to say is that the Algarve as a region has the second highest GDP in Portugal. It also has the second highest per square meter in Portugal as well, just after Lisbon. Also, it is a consolidated destination in terms of real estate where you can find a wide range of investing opportunities, such as from apartments, to resorts, to guaranteed uh, income investments. Also, it is the place where you can actually develop your activity. More now in these times of confinement, we will find that being more towards the south, it's no longer a disadvantage, but a competitive advantage. Out of these, of course, uh, it is very important to say that also the Algarve has the highest foreigner community in Portugal, and that brings a lot of dynamics in terms of the real estate market. So we have a consistent market of new uh, stock, although in now it is very, very balanced and there is no overstock coming into the market. And at the same time, I'd like to call up your attention to another two dimensions that go beyond the hard figures of investment, which we already know and and are, that are very consolidated. I would like to introduce to you the dimension of space. The Algarve has one of the lowest densities of inhabitants in Portugal, below average of about 89 inhabitants per kilometer, square kilometer. So this brings an opportunity of being able to enjoy space, enjoy a low pollution environment. And this brings also another dimension with it, which is called time. When we're in Villamora, in the Algarve in general, time gets a different sensation. You do not have, because of, as well of the great infrastructures that we have, but you do not have queues to go into work. You do not have massive uh, people getting together because it's a low dense region. So we have time to dedicate to what we really like to do. And maybe when we are under this confinement and lockdown, 
We've thought many times about time, and this is probably the best return on investment we can make in real estate so far is buying time. And Algarve, out of all the things that we've seen, a consistent real estate market with consistent uh, per square meter prices with good returns on investment, but also a great place to live and a great place to spare your time. Very good. I like, I like that. I like this return on time. It's very good. I've heard of that recently is the return on wellness and return on well-being. And I think return on time is, um, is, is up there. That's great. Thank you very much, Miguel. Um, only I can give you a round of applause as well as the other, 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 <laughs> the other speakers. Um, that's where the lack of audience participation is, is sad. But there we are. I'm sure they're all clapping. But uh, thank you for, for responding to your first question. We're going to move over to, uh, to Gavin now. Um, Gavin, the Algarve has traditionally attracted, and for many, many years, since the, since the 50s, both a pre-retiree and, already, and a already retired profile of, of UK buyer. Not just, but um, obviously great strength in the, in the UK market. And therefore, the subject of pensions can obviously be a very key factor in that, in that decision making. Could you just kindly flag some of the threats and the opportunities of our structuring, our tax structuring in Portugal? Certainly, but it would be remiss not to thank Miguel for his, um, for his investment advice, um, which is fantastic. I think <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an important one, so I'll move along, I'll move along quickly. Um, Andrew, thank you for your, um, for your question, and thanks to the, the, uh, the British, uh, Portuguese Chamber of Commerce and Open Media for inviting us along today um, to speak. You asked me, um, Andrew, about the, the threats and the opportunities. If I start with the threats, um, I think one of the biggest threats at the moment it comes back to Miguel's point, which is time. So uh, with, uh, with, with Brexit on the horizon, we're, in, we're now in the transition uh, period. Um, there are a number of, of threats that come from that particular angle. Um, so one of the things, when you mention pensions, one of the issues will be that the majority of people have their pensions uh, in coming in sterling um, form. And of course, if they're moving to Portugal, they're buying property in Portugal, um, they will have uh, Portuguese assets at that time, and they'll have expenses and liabilities in, uh, in Euro terms. So one of the things they need to think about is both the impact on their um, pensions uh, around Brexit and what impact Brexit might have on currency movement. So starting to plan. Um, people who a number of years ago were getting one euro 50 for their, uh, for their pound. Um, 12, 18 months ago, so they're getting very close to, within that time, very close to parity. And so they'd have seen their relative net worth um, drop by some, you know, 35%. So it's really important that people look um, at that threat that's coming from a currency perspective, um, and uh, particularly with their pensions, what may happen after, uh, after Brexit. Um, I won't leave on, on that now, maybe um, you'll give me the opportunity to, to come back on the, on the Brexit effect later. But the one thing that um, um, I would highlight is the possibility of an overseas transfer charge. So at the moment, people have the ability, if they're moving out of the UK, um, they could take their pension with them overseas as a lump sum. In doing that, if it's going to a country that you're not resident in, or it's outside of the European Union, you face an overseas transfer charge of 25%. So you would lose 25% of the value of your pension just leaving the UK. However, as we're still in the transitional period, if you are moving your pension within the European Union, we have the free movement of goods, capital, people and services at least until the 31st of December. And so anybody who's considering a move has a window of opportunity now. And here comes the opportunity side um, is to consider that with UK pensions freedoms that came in 2015, George Osborne came along. And if you remember, the papers were full of the Lamborghini budget. People were going to rush out and buy Lamborghinis or villas in the Algarve. Um, and these people were given access to their pensions, but of course it came with tax consequences. Well, at the moment, um, you have all of the freedoms and you also have, through the Portuguese non-habitual residence regime, a load of opportunity. And the fantastic thing at the moment, and the thing that I think is absolutely critical, is that many of us are sitting at home, many of us have been furloughed, many of us have a little bit extra time on our hands, and if we're making plans for uh, the um, return to normal in terms of 
uh, transport and communications, then we should be using this time now. Don't let it disappear. Use it now to make that plan, to get your steps in order. You can plan with certainty. A lot of people say, well, Gavin, we've got no certainty. We've got COVID, we've got Brexit. Um, we have the certainty now. What we won't have is the certainty after the 1st of January. So I would um, say the opportunity is to do the planning now, Andrew. Very good. Wise use of time. Yep. Thank you very much, Kevin. Tiago. Hi. So with you now. Um, tell us a little bit about how Find a Country has managed to continue its operations, um, albeit you know, working from home and, and, and distancing. That's my, that's my first little question to you, and I've got a series of, of s smaller questions, but tell me, tell me about that first, if you would. Um, well, first of all, congratulations on, on this um, venture, and, uh, and thank you for the invitation, and uh, I wish the best of and a happy re quick recovery to, to George. Um, probably he'll be watching us as well. Um, well, during this, this period of COVID-19, uh, obviously we kept working uh, full-time but from home, um, and actually took the opportunity to, to slow down our, from our routines and daily operation to concentrate more on the behind the scenes. Um, so we've been maximizing our online marketing, creating new ways to maximize the exposure of our, of our properties. Uh, we've creating video listings, slideshow videos, virtual uh, tours. Um, and also we've been improving our internal of, of property listings. So lots of, lots of technology being applied, therefore. Um, yeah, I think because uh, it's going to be the trend nowadays and people being more at home, um, digital is, is the keynote. Yeah. And with all of this marketing that, that um, has been invested in, how has, what has the result of that been in terms of a creation of inquiries and leads? And how has that differed? from in inverted commas, the pre-C19 normal profile of, of, of buyer inquiries. Has there been a big change to that? Well, one of the, the impacts of, of the lockdown, obviously, is the amount of, of time people uh, are now spending at home, which allows them to drill on, on what is important to have on their homes, either now or in a post-COVID uh, world. Um, an increase in home working is likely to have a direct impact, uh, for sure, on the residential market, um, and priorities uh, will shift, surely. Um, a demand for a home office will increase. A uh, good Wi-Fi will be a priority, uh, for sure. Um, we had, during this last two months, we had a slight drop on, on inquiries, yes. Uh, not as much as probably would be expecting, uh, thankfully, and with, with, uh, we have more or less the same amount of inquiries as, as the same period last year. Um, and we had a great year last year. Um, but it would, uh, we had still uh, a number of, of inquiries. What we've done um, during this period to these inquiries is uh, what we've done differently. Uh, is that we've done virtual viewings uh, either through a WhatsApp or FaceTime video calls. Um, we've invited uh, clients who had made inquiries for video call meetings where we could go through uh, in more detail with uh, um, their specifications and requirements, uh, which we thought it would be a slightly, a slightly better touch than just an email or a, a telephone call. Um, actually, we could feel that it was, first it was appreciated and uh, we had also people that were needing to see uh, a different face and uh, although <laughs> digitally. Um, what we've done also is sent, uh, listing videos to, to these clients and who made inquiries. Uh, it was something that we would be doing beforehand, but uh, we think that the, um, the feedback and the response was uh, slightly better uh, now. Mm. Doing. Interesting, interesting. Um, so so you've, you, you have refined your sort of marketing process. Um, and you have managed to actually undertake um, sales transactions, and therefore that suggests that all of the, the key players in a in a transaction—lawyers and accountants, notaries, etc.—they're 
um, I wouldn't say have been working as normal, but it has been possible to undertake um, transactions and therefore contract. Definitely. Um, luckily enough, we had, uh, we've completed uh, two or three deals uh, throughout this period. Um, yeah, we've, uh, there was some notaries that did close. Uh, some would be open only by appointment. I know two or three that were working normally, well, not normally, with, uh, with all the new uh, restrictions, more restrictions than security measurements, uh, but they were still working. Um, both legal uh, partners, accountants, uh, they were still working and still there supporting us whenever we needed. So we didn't feel uh, a major issue on, on that situation. We're just being a bit more careful in terms of planning, but it would be fine. Including, including banks as well. Banks were there to, to, to facilitate to help. Um, yeah, online, yes. Uh, yep. Sometimes they would be either at, at the at the banks and uh, well on, on with closed doors, but over on the phone, emails, etc. We have no no issue whatsoever. Very good. So when the world comes back to normal, normal, whenever that's going to be, your life is going to be so much easier with all this technology and these new working practices. It'll give you even more time to to undertake successful sales. Well, we we do think that all the the investment and the the changes that we're doing is improvements, and uh, and for sure they will benefit our our near future for sure. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, we're going to pop back to Gavin now. Um, prior to uh, C nineteen, there were some announcements to, to to the changes, some changes in the non habitual tax regime, which for those of you that don't know. Um, provides for Portugal having one of the, the most attractive um, tax environments um, in the world. Um, could, uh, Gavin, let's assume that amongst our audience online that there are those, there are some people that don't have a great appreciation of, of the NHR. If you just sort of briefly overview it and then talk a little bit about what the future may hold for the program. <laughs> I just got my crystal ball. <laughs> uh, thank you, Andrew. Well, look, um, if, we, if we look back in the past first and say that for over 10 years now, um, Portugal has been keen to attract people into the country and they believe that um, low tax rates are, are one way of, uh, of doing that. Um, and over that 10 year period, we've had um, governments from the left and the right, we've had all colours of, of government, um, and generally they've all adopted this is a sensible um, and attractive way to, uh, to, to go forward. Um, once you have it, it's here to stay. I think that's important to say. So we're talking about things like um, COVID-19 in particular and Brexit, and none of these things will have any um, effect on the fact that um, we can carry on doing our planning sound in the knowledge that um, this, the non-habitual residence regime is here to stay. In the last few weeks, the Portuguese government have come behind it again and said, um, we're determined that this is something that will continue um, for the future. Uh, so what is it for those that haven't come across it? The original idea was to cap a rate of 20% on employment income to encourage um, research and development companies in and bring the best minds from around Europe and the rest of the world um, by capping the uh, rates of income tax that these people would pay to 20%. And that employment income, it's subject to certain conditions, um, but generally if you're looking to come to work in Portugal, you've got projects that you want to bring, um, then that will offer that kind of, uh, of attraction. The next stage is tax exemption on foreign income and, uh, and certain dividends. So if the income was being earned overseas, if the dividends were coming from overseas, then again, these could be tax uh, exempt in Portugal. Again, you read the small print, subject to certain uh, conditions. And then finally, this year on the 1st of April, there was a change that was brought in whereby pensions arising overseas would now be subject to previously zero. Today, they'll be pay a 10% flat rate uh, on uh, on pension income coming from places such as the uh, such as the UK, the important thing, Andrew, is that the devil's in the detail. So this is a tax exemption. It utilises the double tax treaties that exist between the countries where the income is arising and the Portuguese. Uh, tax rules. It's not tax free. So people say, oh, we've got 10 years and everything's tax free. It's not a tax holiday. You've got to make sure that everything bolts correctly. But if you take the correct planning and advice, then you could find that for the next 10 years, 
um, you would have no tax, to pay, uh, sorry, 10% uh, flat tax rate to pay on your overseas pension, and you might not pay any tax at all on dividends that you were receiving from overseas. I say the devil's in the detail because you can have the same asset, give an example, uh, property is a good example. If somebody has a UK uh, property portfolio and they've got income arising from that in the form of rental, UK has the first taxing right, so they will tax at source. Port Portugal will say there's uh, no tax to pay under the non-habitual residence regime on the tax on the income, income arising. However, if you were to sell that property, whereas normally you would have uh, capital gains tax to pay in Portugal. You wouldn't have any capital gains tax to pay in Portugal, and you would only have capital gains tax in the UK from uh, April 2015, when George Osborne introduced um, tax for that. So you're constantly looking to see how you can take advantage of the, um, the linkage between the double taxation treaties between, um, between countries. And I say the good, the good news is that um, Brexit won't affect any of these things. These are agreements that were in place um, with the UK long before the European Union um, and COVID-19 gives us the opportunity to, um, to sit and plan at this time um, for, uh, for, a, for a better day. Have you seen, Gavin, um, activity from um, new potential clients and inquiries coming into the Blevins Franks World Wide Web? We know we've been we were in, uh, very very busy right up until the start of the COVID crisis. Um, it's fair to say that inquiries tailed off a little bit um, from there. That gave us more time to concentrate on existing clients, um, if, if truth be told, and go back and revisit some of their planning. Um, but in the last few uh, in the last few weeks, again, um, inquiries are increasing, and of course they're coming in uh, across the web because people are sitting at home looking and um, making their making their plans now. Uh, for when we're all re released from home and set free in the world again. You were too busy to go on that golf course, Kevin. I'll get on your boat. Too busy again. <laughs> Thank you very much. When I've got the time, the golf course is closed. But the good news is, the good news is that Patrick Thistle haven't lost a match since February. <laughs> uh, lovely. Patrick Thistle is on our nerve. Right, we're going to go over to, to Villamora. Villamora World. Over to, over to, over to Miguel. Um, from, from your perspective, both, both uh, in terms of Villamora and um, looking across the Algarve development world, um, you know, how has that world coped with the last, the last two months? And how have companies adapted um, their operations, their organizations? Um, and I guess as we're, Portugal would have been to move out of of lockdown. To what extent do you think that the experience of the last eight weeks, six eight weeks, um, could actually serve um, Villamora World well and that of other developers? I was using this painful experience. What have we learned, and how can we apply that learning positively going forward? Well, this has been, in fact, a, a very serious uh, situation that we are into. Um, and we have to suddenly uh, react um, very, very quickly to adapt uh, to the new circumstances. So uh, everybody in remote working in a type of business that uh, artificial intelligence was thought to be very far away, suddenly we are bringing technology at the speed of light into our business. So what we've done is basically to adapt ourselves into uh, doing uh, online showings, um, talking to our uh, um, partners, agents, uh, doing webinars. Our construction site continued its works and uh, we were able to open our show home. In and actually we even did uh, a promotion, a launch, a virtual launch called See Our Home From Your Home uh, in partnership with the UK Chamber of Commerce. Portugal UK Chamber of Commerce. So what we've done at one point is to really and fastly adapt in getting online tools to help everybody doing business. Another very important issue is uh, to deal with clients. Our clients are of course the most important factor for us and this is why we exist and the reason for that we've kept an open and transparent communication with them giving all the updates regarding the property and also giving them notice of the new um, uh, online tools that we have developed. So we had to adapt very, very, very quickly. And uh, we also uh, 
have tried to go on into doing something that we truly believe it's something that adds value into the business and making sure and leaving people comfortable that although we are having now a freeze of demand, we do not have oversupply. So people are very much concerned about now prices are gonna drop down very dramatically. And I'm sure we will have time to discuss a little bit more on that. But we wanted to make sure and our clients sure that they invested in the right time. And the, uh, we don't make decisions, real estate business is a cycle, a long-term cycle. So we don't do, take decisions in the oven as we don't take decisions in the freezer. Um, we have to wait and see how this will evolve. But there is something that has for sure changed. We have leaped into technology. We have brought down the barriers of having technology with us. And now we are going to be more efficient with our partners, with our clients, because we will be able to be closer, directly closer, and looking at each other, just like we are doing now. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Tiago. Um, as we hope we are all moving towards unlocking, um, certainly in Portugal, and eventually we hope um, in the UK, uh, more will be known today, it probably is being known as I speak, as the Prime Minister is speaking at the moment in the, in the House of Parliament. Um, what do you think will be the like reaction of the property market post unlock? And do you envisage a big, some, well, a bounce back, as it's sometimes termed, in demand? Well, it's like Gavin was saying, is we don't have a crystal ball. It's, it's difficult to say and probably still too soon to predict what exactly will, will happen. Uh, probably the more conservative will say that it will take a long time to have buyers out again. The optimistic will say that we'll have a V-shape, a V-shape uh, bounce back. Um, I would bet more in the middle. And uh, I think we'll have more like an EU shape with clients gaining confidence gradually. Um, as, as we saw the, 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 the skip hope uh, in the beginning and with the, all the, the, the good press about Portugal and the Algarve and the way we've been handling with, with the crisis uh, and with all the, um, the rewards that we've, we've been having the best touristic destination, the, the best deep beach destination, the best place to, to live and retire post-COVID uh, by Forbes magazine uh, recently. Um, I think the desire is, is still there and, uh, and probably now more than ever. Um, so, and, and both for, for those who, who already knew about Portugal and for those who didn't know about Portugal and with, because of the press starting to hear about us. Um, Although we might not have um, a lot of clients uh, wandering around uh, in the near future, we still maintain very positive about the, the, the future. I think it's, it's important um, to note uh, related to that, that there is, and Miguel alluded to this, um, the Algar property market is relatively balanced in terms, of, in terms of supply and demand. I think this is a legacy Actually, it's a post-financial crisis legacy. So there is, there is wariness, understandably, by developers and investors about investing and over-developing. And therefore, you have a naturally very balanced picture of, of supply and demand. And there probably is, at this point in time, or there was certainly pre-COVID-19, probably more demand than there was of certain profiles of supply. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that generally that, that we're in a pretty healthy situation. Um, as we look forward to uh, to the summer, we're going to go back to Gavin, and Gavin overviewed um, the Brexit. Um, well, reminded us, in fact, of course, that the Brexit clock um, still continues to uh, to tick. Um, Gavin, talk to us about how you've been helping your clients um, prepare for for Brexit, and perhaps. You know, wave a few, wave a few flags. We don't want to be too frightened today. Um, we want to have a positive webinar. Um, but if there are, you know, if there are concerns which you have um, related to Brexit, um, then it would be very helpful, of course, for you to outline those today. 
and then later on, uh, you know, the audience can then engage with your company. Thank you, Andrew. I'm conscious that, that people would like to get their own um, questions in, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and be uh, quite brief. But I think the point that, you, that you're making there about Brexit and so on is that um, these clocks continue to, to count down and we will not be in a COVID situation forever. And we're currently saying, let's use this time to do the planning. Um, people have got to be thinking just the key points for me will be in terms of wrapping up uh, Euro income, matching their Euro liabilities doing their, their tax planning steps to say, well, um, regardless of, uh, of COVID, I've still got to think that uh, I get my, my planning right. When do I capitalize my ISAs if I'm going to make a, my, my move? My uh, UK savings vehicles, independent uh, individual savings accounts, um, mopping up UK allowances such as capital gains tax. The tax year remains exactly the same regardless of, of COVID or, or Brexit. So thinking those things through. Big focus on pensions and making sure that people maximise um, the opportunities that currently exist there for being able to consider what they can do with defined benefit schemes. That's an extremely tricky area, but one that people have to take um, independent uh, advice on. Should they use a euro-denominated self-invested person pension plan in the UK? Is it more appropriate to move the pension out of the UK altogether to qualify and recognise overseas schemes? So again, making sure that they take advice from uh, if it's UK stuff, taking advice from UK regulated um, financial advisors. Um, and I think that uh, post Brexit and the, the, uh, the one thing that we're watching from a COVID perspective is that what changes will that bring to pensions, pensions freedoms, pensions taxation, um, and taxation in general, if we think that all of the money that's currently being spent by the Portuguese government, by the UK government, all of that money will have to be recovered somewhere. Um, governments don't have money, governments only have what we give them, um, and we give it through, uh, through taxes. So we've got to be cognizant that the plans we make today will be affected for a long time to come because of COVID, but the fantastic thing we've got today is the ability to plan for it. We know it's coming. How do we set out our stall to make sure we're in the right place to receive the least amount of damage from it in the, in the long term? And that clock is ticking down to the 31st of December for a lot of the planning that people um, will need to, uh, need to be thinking of. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. We, we do have a couple of couple more questions before we uh, tackle uh, the questions. Um, of, our, of our audience. Um, and perhaps what I would say is this, is that we haven't, everybody's busy, I know, but we, most of us are working from home and time invested in these virtual gatherings, conferences are of value. So we don't need to stop at three o'clock or, or 10 past three. So let's not rush now. Have, um, and let's just, let's just, let's keep, let's keep the webinar rolling um, for as long as we've got the relevant questions so i don't want to i don't want to really rush now the end of webinar we had some challenges we lost some time at the front end so tiago um do you think that post c19 by emotives and psychology people's psychology by a psychology people interested in the market may have changed and related to that um could there be as a result of that demand demand for different types of products or projects or developments? Well, great question, Andrew. Um, I think that for those who are looking, uh, who would be looking and still looking for a holiday property, I don't envisage, uh, don't expect that that will have a significant change on their requirements. They will still look for a low maintenance, easy lock up and go with pool, access to a common swimming pool, close to the beach, to the golf, restaurants, amenities. And eventually, most of the cases, they will uh, be looking with a rental return potential. Now, where I can see actually um, a change is an, an, uh, an increase on demand is for the residential market. For those, for the people and families who want to relocate here in, in Portugal and the Algarve. Those for sure will be, because it's going to be their first home and primary home, they will be more criteria and specific with their requirements. Uh, they will be looking for good quality homes, smart houses with high standards of specifications, well insulated with energy efficient, um, not necessarily in resorts, but maybe more with a feel of being part of the community. Um, because they were 
some of them, we, we can see them during this lockdown period in apartments, locked in apartments with, with children working from home and realize that first, they, they, they need more living space and outdoor space. And secondly, because working remotely is possible uh, and in many cases will be predominant in the future, um, they will look for homes with bigger areas uh, where they can have dedicated areas for work in either in, in a, a room in, in the villa or an annex in, in the garden. And, uh, and for sure, uh, which is, has been uh, a must in most of our latest clients, and I think it's going to be a must must in, in the future, is a good internet connection. Good. Um, probably the, the questions that I was posing to Tiago and Miguel have had to have some similarities. Miguel, um, is there anything else that you'd like to say on the, on the demand side to complement what Tiago was saying? And then secondly, do you believe that um, the Algarve development and investment community is prepared or ready perhaps to make quite substantial changes to, to what is being thought, conceived, designed and, and delivered? Well, I think um, we have to, we have to, as I mentioned before, um, client is the reason why we are here. So if we have, and we also mentioned that there is not an oversupply, but it is also truth that customers will buy what they want. And I think the biggest shift, and it's quite amazing that um, I'm, I'm here saying this, but it's the reality. Uh, our developments have to become human centric. People will be the protagonists of buying units and for sure we have to adapt to a new reality which is something that we're doing right now people will be working remotely people will be attending meetings remotely instead of traveling and um, in that sense we will have to adapt our spaces in terms of a certain hybridization of space where it has the function of residence leisure and now work so we will have for sure to find ways in terms of uh, cost constructions, materials that are going to be used, uh, technology, and I'm talking about industrialization probably of concrete uh, or other materials that can be pre-built and then put into place and we can module its flexibility that we're talking about. Also, we will be using probably 3D technology exactly to adapt to that. And also, in terms of the relationship with our customer, we will find a new and also fun, I would say, technology called gamification, where we can actually together, side by side, or screen by screen, better said, we would be able to, um, in fact, decorate the home of the person. And when they come, they actually uh, will, will be able to immediately uh, close, close the deal. It will also be more efficient because people now will be able to shop around and know exactly beforehand they come, they can actually have online views. So uh, for the developers, what we will have to do is find imaginative ways, creative ways, but thinking on the client. Thinking on the client in a way where we can actually make cities that are coming and becoming now also in our case that we are working remotely are becoming from smart cities to smart villages where connection, energy production or self-production is very important. So we have to create the conditions for, for that. And also that means that the price per square meter will be higher as much as we can actually adapt the product to what the, the client wants. And people have been closed and now they pay more attention than any other moment to where they live or where they would like to live or what type of life they would like to take from now on. And this will have a huge impact in the way we think about our urbanism, but for sure it will have a dramatic impact on how we design our projects. Very good. I fully agree with you, Miguel. I fully agree. Um, we have reached the end of our nine question to our, to our speakers. And, um, Generally, when people, somebody's talking to me, I generally like to look at them. And therefore, I haven't been able to look at my, my iPhone, which has been buzzing away, which um, contains 
some of the questions that we have um, from our audience. Um, and uh, Adriana has been managing that at the other end of our group WhatsApp. Um, so Adriana, I'm now going to try to um, chair this next session, an important session, uh, because it's questions from the audience. So um, here we go. Um, and Adriana, if I get it wrong, then just say, Andrew, you've got it wrong. Um, I think the first question um, is from a gentleman called David Foster. Um, and I think it's either to Miguel or to everyone. And Mr. Foster asks the following. Can you please comment on the short-term impact of C19 and the recession on prices in the 0 to 700k euro um, price point and the 700k to 1.5 million euro uh, price point? So can you please comment on the short-term impact of C19 and the recession on prices in the 0 to 700k and then 700k to 1.5 million euros? Miguel, you first. Um, well, you uh, thank you for, for your question, David. Um, let, me, let me, in a way, uh, put, it some, put us a little bit in context. Um, we, uh, and against uh, uh, what we spent from 2008, 2011, 12 here in Portugal, and be, be, after that until now, it, in fact, in the peak of uh, going down the market, we have a 20% uh, price decrease. Um, until now that we have already recovered and we are pre-2007 prices. Um, I think that we have to establish also a differentiation more than pricing, uh, whether it's secondhand or new build. If we think about secondhand, then it really goes on the need of individuals to sell. Because the demand is there, there is not an oversupply, but people may have personal uh, conditions and make them sell and the time of sale because of this uh, demand freeze is of course longer maybe people have other circumstances that are facing unemployment so they will for sure come into the market selling fast and lowering prices however not in the case of new built new built we have now a totally different structured market from banks and also the real estate promoters uh, nowadays, we don't have an overfinanced, um, overly financed project, and at the same time, we don't have an oversupply of stock. So, in my, in our particular case in Villamora, uh, where all my uh, the two projects that we have ongoing are over 50% of sales, I don't have any motivation on lowering prices. Also, in terms of normal market, and again. Remember that real estate is a long-term cycle market. We cannot take decisions based on short-term uh, events. We have to have some more time to see how this is going and uh, with some tranquility, look at the market and react. But I'm for sure um, and very much convinced that we are just seeing a freeze of demand. We don't have oversupply. So in terms of the new build, we will not expect to um, lowering prices and it will actually continue or, or as Tiago mentioned we'll see uh, either a U or a, a, a V square root where uh, actually we were looking towards stabilizing prices. Just a final note in Portugal we saw in January a price increase of 1.2 percent in February a price increase of 1.4 percent and still in March we saw a price increase of 0.4 percent. So what we're seeing here is that this is a resilient market and uh, for the new build, for sure, the professional market, I um, don't see that there are conditions already made that, so that we lower prices. Thank you, Miguel. Tiago, would you like to, to complement uh, Miguel's thoughts? Not much more than to, to say than uh, what Miguel said, because actually the, the, the market, um, there is still the demand. There was still uh, a lot of supply. Um, and it was, this crisis was not originated by uh, lack of demand or, or supply. It was basically a, a pandemic crisis. Um, yes, the, the interest is, is, is still here. Um, I don't see uh, prices dropping uh, unless, again, like Miguel was saying, on the private individuals, private vendors, that they have the need to, to sell the, the properties. Yes, we are seeing 
some uh, vultures uh, coming around already and inquiring about uh, good opportunities. Um, but again, I don't see those uh, happening on, on a short notice, if ever. Um, Adriana, I think we have a, a, a message from Alison Bendel to everyone. Is that right? Is that the, was that the next? Was that the next question? Uh, the next question we had here was from Lorraine Elliott. Yeah, to oh, Lorraine, no, Lorraine no, Elliott. Elliot. Yes. Do you want to read it or shall I, Andrew? No, will you? Because I'm a little bit lost. Okay. What, yes, we are on project? this specifically to him. No, no, no. Sorry, not that one. It's from Gisema. Apologies, but the WhatsApp group has had quite a few questions. Just How has the yeah. market been affected so far? It's a question for Tiago. How has the fact the market been affected so far? Uh, well, I, I think I've I've mentioned that um, throughout this this period of of lockdown, the the number of inquiries didn't decrease as much as we would expect. We had a few less than uh, the same uh, period last year. Um, what what changed was actually the, the physical viewings. They couldn't happen because they were in lockdown in their country of origin. Um, for those who were here whilst in lockdown, we couldn't do anything. But since last week, we are out on physical viewings. We are already doing virtual viewings. Um, I had three viewings uh, from the five days of work we had. Uh, I was out three days in, in viewings. I have viewings tomorrow, Wednesday, Friday. So I can't say I'm, I'm working as much as I would be on a normal situation. Um, I don't see this being affected uh, for the moment. Again, I think the desire is still there. And more than ever, people wanting to, to relocate in, in Portugal and wanting to have bigger properties. Okay, thank you. Um, I, we, have, we had a, a um, question from Alison Bendel uh, to, to everyone. There is some repetition, understandably, in, in some of the questioning. Um, so um, Alison asks, pre-COVID, it seemed that we were heading towards a point where the demand was going to be greater than the supply. Do you see this reversing and affecting property prices this year? It's actually, there's actually two questions. So let's, let, let's contemplate that. So pre-COVID, it seemed that we were heading towards a point where the demand was going to be greater than the supply. Do you see this reversing and affecting property prices this year? Miguel, I think we've actually probably already, already uh, we've, covered we've touched that. We've, we've touched that, but um, yeah. what, what in fact the, the thing is that um, uh, I would say, and, and, and I would like to uh, touch on the uh, competitive advantage of the Algarve. Uh, mentioned and we, we introduced, introduced as well and how pricing will affect. Again, um, the Algarve has the second highest per square meter pricing in Portugal and it's been very consolidated over the years. And it's, it's a market that has a great real estate dynamics. And also I think that the fact that people will see the Algarve as a second home is an opportunity because we will see some kind of uh, privatizing of the holidays uh, because people will be will not want to be in such big gatherings and going into hotels and sharing swimming pools and mattresses and all of that so that brings a great investment opportunity in terms of buying to rent to lease uh, I would say that in comparison to a Porto in Lisbon Airbnbs or short-term leases will keep strong in, in the Algarve because of this reason also we will see as well People making more possible the, the possibility of um, uh, uh, renting all year round. This is a market that will also open, but also we will see the increase of first residences because right now people will lose the need of being in the city. They, and, and also the Algarve has um, more than three high level international schools. Families, like my case, for example, uh, we can move here and everybody would say, oh, you're going to the Algarve, you're far away from everything. It's just not true. And from everywhere in the Algarve, we're less than an hour to International Airport. We are one hour and 45 minutes to Seville, two and a half hours to Lisbon. So we are really, it's about putting the geography in the right place and having this quality of life and choosing the life that you want to have. And now, because choosing where you want to live has become such human-centric, people will think about the benefits, and the benefits are quality of life. 
our time, our space. And that is where the Algarve will come with a great competitive advantage. And that will reflect in pricing because I truly believe that that will increase demand. Do you think that, that Portugal or the Algarve, um, Algarve can therefore be more um, competitive against our neighbors? Well, oh, definitely, yeah. definitely, because uh, we already are, because um, we have bet more. There are some mistakes done in the past, urbanistically, that's not uh, hide that. But nowadays, everything has been planned with the, um, with a sense, with, a, with an ecological thought and uh, with a lower density uh, capacity and in the way we think about urbanism. So um, I'm sure that the perception of Portugal, the way we've handled this situation, uh, as for sure come as, a, as an improvement. And uh, if anyone would be deciding to go in from uh, Cadiz or uh, Malaga, I'm sure that they would decide coming into uh, the Algarve, Central Algarve or Lagos or, or Vila Real San Antonio. For sure, Portugal and the Algarve mainly will have a higher competitive advantage after this. Um, we're just gonna go back to the second part of the question from, from Alison Bendel. Um, in Portugal, we've seen a very sensible assessment and response to the crisis, but our client base is European and so tied to the easing in other countries. Could it also be a high demand in more isolated country or rural properties over the coastal and frontline properties? How, do, how does the panel think that this could um, change demand? Uh, I, I can answer that. I, I think that um, I've also touched that with um, with the, the psychological difference from from the clients. Those will be looking for a residential market. You'll have a bit of both. Providing the house reunites the characteristics they're looking for, um, they will be okay to be. You have clients for everybody. You you have clients that want to be around golf, or want to have clients that want to be front line, or they want to be on a very large um, area gardens with no no neighbors around, um, and still within twenty minutes they can be on a city, or in half an hour they can be in the in the airport, one hour. So, providing the house has the requirements they will be looking for. I don't think there will be any any problem with that. Okay. Anybody any other any other observations related to that? Gavin, would you like to be an impartial, non property, directly property person observation? I think a lot of this relates back to um a question that uh, I think Lorraine was asking. Um, uh, alongside Alison, and it's about COVID and how does it um, how does it affect us all? And if we look around the uh, the speakers that are here today, yourself included, Andrew, um, as in as, as individuals, we've all uh, got our businesses running from um, running from home, and we're adapting to a different way of uh, of life currently. Um, I think the sad thing in all of this is that we treat all of these statistics just as they as they are, and we become hardened to them. And yet, every statistic at the moment, we should remember. Um, is somebody who's been affected by this uh, this uh, terrible um, condition and our thoughts are with them while we're talking about this. Um, but I think people will think more about, um, as Miguel has said, as Tiago, the suitability of the properties that they're, um, that they're looking at. What am I going to be buying? Where am I going to be living? And we've been very fortunate in the Algarve in that even though our office has been closed um, for meetings, we've all been able to move uh, home to self isolate in areas to be able to go to supermarkets and we're not facing the huge queues that we see in other parts of the, um, of the world that pick up the UK um, television. There's half a million of us spread across the Algarve in an area that's really designed and capable of handling um, millions of, of people in a foot coming in and out on a fortnightly basis. So during the majority of the year, apart from that six week high season, um, we do enjoy a particularly uh, high level of, uh, of lifestyle 
lifestyle that gives us that space. And I'm sure that that's one of the things that will maintain the attraction of the Algarve as we go forward. And the trick will be for the developers um, and the uh, producers of product, people like Villa Mura World, um, like yourself, where you're looking at projects and saying, how will people use this product in the future? Because for sure, we have the infrastructure to, uh, to handle it and deal with it here in Algarve. And so the other things that are happening around us um, really just focus the, the, uh, the attention back on Algarve as a, as a destination that really is second to none. If you, if you couple the, uh, the availability of suitable property with um, um, one of my colleagues, uh, Bruce, is, is sending me through information that the, uh, the banks are still lending. And of course, interest rates are at all time, uh, all time lows. There's never been a better time to borrow in that sense. Um, so the, the, uh, the lending is still there that hasn't been um, affected. If we go back to the previous crisis, that was all about um, the access to access to capital. That was a financial crisis. There's none of that going on. The underlying market behind us at the moment, the economic market, is act was actually very, very strong going into this. And governments um, around the world have stepped up um, in America, in the UK, um, and across Europe. Uh, the Portuguese are doing it and saying we will support the economy through this, we will find ways um, and they've been doing it through furloughing and so on. It's a short, short, it'll be a short period of time, I believe, in, in, uh, in history and the background to it is so incredibly strong. We're not facing a systemic crisis the way we did um, with, the, uh, uh, with the cash crisis um, 10, 10 years ago. This is a very different, a very different case. Um, so I'm very positive about the, uh, about the outlook. Likewise. Adriana, do we have any questions from the audience that we have missed? I have missed. Uh, no, I think we answered pretty much everyone because they start, well, of course, we start touching the, the, the same things. There's yes. one last question here from Sydney ah. Lewis. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, it's very bottom. It's the very last one. Um, it says, what's the likely impact on residential investment property? on the inability to travel. Uh, the airline industry has a massive challenge to provide a safe environment, uh, given the issue with recycled air in pressurized cabins. So the, the, the travel agency, the travel industry, I don't say it would be for any of you to answer, but the rest of the question, perhaps. One for Andrew. I, 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 I'm sorry, I was interrupted. Could you re read the question again? What is the likely impact on, resi on residential investment property on the inability to travel? Um, I, well, it all depends what we define as residential investment property. Um, certainly the inability to travel. Let's, let's look at that. Um, I had a call last Friday with um, an aviation expert, an ex um, VA operations guy and a professor um, of, of aviation. Very knowledgeable man, a guy called Gavin um, Eccles. Not Gavin Scott, Gavin Eccles. Um, and Gavin is very optimistic, uh, specifically for the future of connectivity, the short term future of connectivity into the Algarve. And why is that? Because the low cost carriers that, that move generally around Europe um, do not require intercontinental or international links to bring um, population, to bring travelers um, into Europe. Yes, of course, EasyJet um, and Ryanair have for now suspended operations from, as, you know, from, from, from the UK market, um, but there are flights or will be flights from, from Ryanair come July. We've learned recently about uh, new flights coming to Faro from Wizz Air out of Luton um, and um, the, the Dutch carriers, the German carriers, uh, the Dutch are still, are still carrying. Um, and so I guess the question really is, is, is at what point in time that, that does the, the, the carrier market and Faro become um, unlocked? Uh, and I'm not really clear about that, but logically if Ryanair is now has now announced flights in July, and you can buy flights um, in July, as you can from Wizard into Faro. It presupposes that there has there is agreement with the Faro airport manager. Um, so therefore, I think that we really are 
looking at something which is going to fundamentally affect a single quarter of business. We've been paralyzed in this in this Q2, and now we're all pre- and now we're all preparing for for Q3, the summer quarter, which is which of course is operationally so 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 important to to the Algarve. Um, and I just hope that we may be pleasantly surprised by the relative connectivity that it may be possible to achieve um, in July and August, um, at least coming out of the UK market, which are afterwards more than 50% of, of demand, um, and in the secondary and tertiary markets, Benelux and, and Germany. Um, vis-a-vis the residential investment market, um, that's, that's a massive question, which has got so many different types of answers for different parts of, of the market. Um, there are resort projects um, in the Algarve, which are selling their projects with, with guaranteed residential investment returns. Um, and 5% returns, um, guaranteed for five years. Um, and that I know of, and I'm fairly well informed. Those developers have not ceased to offer um, those investment returns on those projects. Um, and I don't think they will because many projects today are very well founded in the structure of their capital. And therefore, there is far more solidity regarding um, this aspect um, than there was in, in previous years or, or certainly pre uh, uh, post-financial crisis or pre-financial crisis. So I am confident that there can in the future be another, um, and there still is a, a residential investment market, um, but residential investment returns a residential property um, realistically um, in, in seasonal destinations such as the Algarve um, are going to be less than 5%, two, three or 4%. And then you have to answer the question, is that gross, is that net, is that pre-tax, post-tax? And that becomes a whole new debating point for another, for another seminar or for another, for another webinar. Um, but also, Andrew, let me just uh, hop in. And how does that compare with other investment opportunities such as stock exchange? So probably, uh, even though you get those returns, better to have those returns because you know that you will have them back in a long-term cycle of investment. But it's a safe and, and, uh, and, uh, and a refuge uh, type of investment. So um, I would say that probably, and uh, there, although there are so many doubts and so many questions inside that question, uh, I'll just add to another opportunity for uh, residential and the resilience of investing in re- residential in the residential market is also that it would, there will be probably a shift of uh, investment direction towards uh, real estate rather than other products. Just, 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 just to close, uh, uh, just a small example. Um, I was talking to an agent the other day about the wonderful micro market of Cabanas, Cabanas de Tavira in, in the Eastern Algarve, where I know that the post financial crisis, a number of small developers have been quietly preparing projects for launching um, uh, last year and this year. And um, the the average price per square meter of um, product, apartment product, in the main, in the delightful cabanas, um, has gone up from just less than 3,000 euros per square meter to 3,500 euros per square meter in the, since the markets came back. Um, so I think that you know, return is about cap, long-term capital return. Um, and regarding yield, residential yield investments, really with, with, with very few, with, there are few exceptions, then um, I suggest that um, that's a, it's a different geography, okay? The Algarve is the Algarve. The Algarve is a wonderful uh, lifestyle environment where there, are, there are, where there are investments to be made which really are very, very solid. And I think perhaps that, that probably for today, we should begin to conclude. Therefore, I'm going to start concluding. Maybe I have concluded. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't manage to um, perhaps bring everybody that had registered to, um, to the webinar for technological reasons. I hope that those of you that have managed to get on, the first 100 
um, to, to jump in. First come, first serve. Um, have appreciated, have enjoyed, and, and I'm going, uh, going to leave the webinar today um, more motivated and more, more um, informed. Um, I am passionate about the Algarve, an affinity for the Algarve, and I have no doubts whatsoever that um, the post-COVID-19, the, the, the Algarve will bounce back very, very, very strongly. The inherent, the inherent natural assets of the Algarve uh, have even greater value um, uh, than, than before, further to post-COVID-19. So I wish you all um, a great week. Let me thank the speakers. Um, great job, fine, fine fit men. Um, thank you to Adriana for masterminding and for Elena, quietly there in the background, and to Chris Barton, to Bruce Hawker of Open Media and the Algar resident. And I hope I haven't forgotten anybody. Um, but thank you all very, very much indeed. Um, and um, let's consider doing this again. And uh, I wish you a, a great, great rest of, great rest of week. Or semana. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew, very, very okay. much for uh, joining us and and uh, being the um, master of ceremonies here in this in this webinar, which you did magnificently. Uh, thank you also to our speakers, Miguel, Diago, Gavin. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to Algar Resin because this uh, webinar was um, organized, was thought of by Algar Resin, who joined, who was then the, the chamber to join them, and we were very pleased to jump in. So, um, apologies once again for the technical issues. We do, do not know what happened, but we will get to the bottom of it, and we will be sending a link for the video to all those who haven't been able to be here as well as those who have, who want to maybe watch it again, a bit more calm. Um, and that's it. Well, taking Andrew's words, Boa semana. And thank you. Boa semana. See you soon. Bye-bye.